Welcome everybody to today's uh, talk at Uppsala Algebra Seminar. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Gregoire Nays from Max Planck Institute uh, in Bonn. And he will tell us about the categorification of the Lorentz Kramer Bigelow break group representation using two Verma modules. Please, Gregoire. All right. So, hi, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and be able to, to share a bit my work with you. Um, so yes, my goal for today is to explain to you how to categorify this so-called uh, Lorentz Kramer Bigelow red group representation. And uh, for this, we will use um, categorification of Verma modules. So I will assume that uh, you don't know any of what this is about. So um, in the first part, I will explain to you a bit uh, what is quantum SL2, what are some of its important representation and how to uh, categorify them. Uh, and so this, is, this will be based on uh, the work that I did with uh, Petro Vaz during my, my PhD thesis. And then in the second part, I will explain to you how to extend this um, categorification of Verma module to tensor product, and also how to categorify the breeding, which in the end will give us this uh, categorification of Lorentz Kramer Bigelow group representation. Okay. Um, okay, and I, I guess that uh, most of you already uh, know about this um, these quantum groups, but I, I still want to be sure that we are all on the same page. So let me recall you uh, what is quantum SL2. So you, usually you would look at uh, your um, Lie algebra SL2 of two by two matrices of trace zero. And this Lie algebra, it admits um, a universal enveloping algebra, which is an infinite dimensional algebra, associative algebra, uh, who has the same, um, basically the same representation theory as the, the Lie algebra SL2. And you can construct this by generators and relation. And now these quantum groups is some deformation of it. So you will take some of these uh, relation and introduce some parameter Q in order to make it a bit less symmetric. Uh, and so formally, you can define this quantum SL2 as the QQ algebra. So you work uh, with coefficient in a ring of fraction generated by these four guys, E, F, K, and K minus one, uh, subject to the following relation that are um, the formation of the, the, the SL2 relation. So if, if, you don't know, if you know nothing about this, you can just take this as a definition, an ad hoc definition. So this is quantum SL2. Um, one of its in, in interesting properties of this, uh, this algebra is that it can be endowed with uh, a multiplication and a co-unit to turn it into a bi-algebra. Um, and of course, you can do this already for the, the, the enveloping algebra of SL2. But the difference now is that you don't get something that is um, co-commutative because you have this uh, parameter, well, it is a variable k here that makes your commutation um, non-co-commutative. So you get a, a bi-algebra that is neither commutative nor co-commutative. And this is actually basically what um, characterizes quantum groups. Um, okay. And, and, and so actually, more than being bi-algebra, these are Hopf algebra, but we don't need to care about the, the, the Hopf structure for, for this talk. Now, the interesting thing is that because uh, you have this structure of a bi-algebra, you can equip their category of representation with um, a tensor product so that you get a monoidal category. And the way you do it is simply by using the commultiplication. Uh, I will come back to this later in, in the second part. And even more than simply being monoidal, this category are actually braided. And, and basically, this means you have a, a braid group action on the, on, on, on the category somehow. <clears throat> and so this means that we can use uh, representation theory of quantum groups to construct bread group representation. And also, um, if you choose carefully the representation, you can construct not invariants, such as the joint polynomial or the, uh, and, and these kind of things. And, and this is why uh, someone like me who is more of the, on the topological side will be interested in, in, in quantum groups and their representation. Uh, now here is a, a small remark, is that the, the representation theory of quantum SL2 Basically, look, basically looks like the same as for classical SL2. 
do not take this uh, to, to, to precisely, but basically. Um, now, the thing is, if you specialize Q to one, so if you go back to, to the, the usual SL2 and not the quantum deformation, you will lose all information about the topology. So we, you will not be able to see uh, the difference between, say, an undercrossing and an uh, overcrossing. And so that's why quantum groups are uh, more interesting for topologies than uh, usual uh, Lie algebra. Um, <clears throat> OK. And, and now the idea is um, to apply categorification on this. So categorification is not really like an algorithm. It's more like a, a philosophy uh, about lifting structure to the categorical setting. So usually you will turn sets into category, elements into object, and, and reveal some new, higher, interesting layer. And in order to make this a bit more precise, I want to, to present you the, a classical example. And it is the, the cellular homology of, a, say, a CW complex or something like this. Um, and, and so you can think of the cellular homology as a complex that lives in the homotopy category of um, complexes. And if you compute its uh, graded dimension, so if you want like the alternating sum of the dimension of the space in your complex, uh, you will get the Euler characteristic in, in the ring of integer because you will have like the number of zero cell minus the number of one cell plus two cells and so on. And, and so you can think of this as an example of category of, um, of categorification. So the, the cellular homology categorify the Euler characteristic. Um, and so categorification will be about looking at something that, that you know, like uh, the Euler characteristic or the ring of integer, and try to lift, in, lift it to some categorical setting like complexes and, and the category, the homotopy category of complexes. Um, and then, of course, like I said, you usually reveal a new uh, interesting higher layer. And in this example, it will be the map induced between homology. Because of course, if you have like a continuous map between space, you can say nothing between the Euler characteristics, but you have an induced map between the, the homology groups. And now the idea is basically to apply this philosophy of categorification to the representation theory of quantum groups in order to try to get richer topological invariants, so like homology theory for rings or richer bread group uh, representation and, and, and things like that. Uh, and so a bit more precisely, what it will mean to, uh, to categorify a quantum group representation, well, usually you would have your quantum group that act on some vector space by um, endomorphism. Well, here the idea will be to replace this vector space by a category whose um, group and group, so it's the group generated by the classes of isomorphism up maybe to some um, relation given by uh, exact sequence and, and things like that. But OK, so you want to find a category whose Grotendi group uh, is essentially your vector space. And coming with a collection of endofunctor, one for each of your generators of your quantum groups, that respect the relation of uh, the quantum group up to natural isomorphism. So somehow you have a bit more freedom because you don't have a strict equality anymore, like in the, in the vector space case. OK, and so now my goal will be to, to explain to you how we can categorify uh, some of the representation of quantum SL2. And so first I need to tell you which one. Uh, the, the first collection of representation that will be of interest for us will be the finite dimensional um, irreducible module. And basically for each uh, non-negative integer uh, n, you have one uh, finite dimensional irreducible module of dimension n plus two. Well, actually you have two of them because you can introduce some sign in the construction, but for the sake of this talk, uh, we'll just focus on, on one. And you can describe it very explicitly. So um, here I have V0, V1, Vk up to, to Vn, which are um, basis elements. So I have n plus one elements because I have an n plus one dimensional vector space. And then uh, I just need to specify the structure's constant. So how E, F, and, and K of my quantum group will act. Uh, so K will simply act by multiplication by some um, coefficient, so Q to uh, some power. Uh, and E and F will um, increase and or decrease the uh, basically the index of my, 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 my um, basis element. So F will send V0 to V1, and then V1 to V2, V2 and so on. And, and E will uh, decrease. And 
while doing so, it's also multiplied by some coefficient. And these coefficients are um, quantum integer. So the quantum integer k is simply the, the fraction q to the k minus q minus k on q minus q minus 1, which you can simplify as a finite polynomial of um, k term. So if you specialize q to 1, you will just have uh, the integer k, okay, the usual one. And so, okay, so uh, for example, v1 will be sent to quantum 2 v2 when I, while I'll act with f. And essentially, you just need to verify one relation to, to check that it is indeed a, a representation for quantum SL2. And it is this so called uh, commutator relation EF minus FE should be K minus K minus 1 on Q minus Q minus 1, which is the, the quantum deformation of the usual SL2 relation EF minus FE equal H. And in, in, in this case, you can easily verify uh, just by doing computation by hand that uh, this equality hand uh, holds and actually that it is equal to the quantum integer n minus 2k. Uh, for example, we can do it here on, on this v0, the, the highest weight vector. If I act with e uh, first, I'm sent to 0. So this will act at 0. And this part act as first multiplication by uh, quantum 1, which is 1, and then quantum n. So I will multiply by quantum n if I do uh, this left part here. Uh, and on the other hand, if I apply k minus k minus 1 on q minus q minus 1, I will have q to the n minus q minus n on q minus q minus 1, which is quantum n. So that is uh, good. So this is actually very, very classical stuff. Uh, and, and the other um, representation that will be of interest for us uh, is the universal Verma module. And in order to define it, what I first need to do is fix some um, formal parameter beta. Or actually, I want to, to fix a formal parameter lambda that I will think of as q power beta, where beta is some generic, generic parameter. And so this means that I will actually need to work over the ground ring of a rational fraction in q and lambda, so in two variables for, for my universal verma. And then, um, I can simply construct it explicitly as the infinite dimensional uh, vector space with basis element w0, w1, and so on. So now I do not stop. I have infinitely many of these uh, w guys. Um, now my, my element, my Carton element k, it will act by uh, my highest weight vector here as lambda, and then lambda q minus 2, and so on. So you decrease the power of q by 2 each time you, you increase the, the index of w. And again, E and F jump uh, to the left or uh, to the right, multiplying by some coefficient. So here for the F, you have the, sum, the same coefficient as in the finite dimensional guy. And for the E, you now need to act with this um, shifted quantum integer, beta plus k, that you simply define uh, uh, the same as before. So Q, Q to beta plus k minus Q minus beta minus k on Q minus Q minus 1. And of course, this q beta, you need to replace them by, by the lambda because you, this is really a formal uh, variable. And again, you can simply check that uh, the commutator relation holds in, in this case. And so this is really the, the guide that we will want to, to categorify. Now, um, this, Verma, this Verma module uh, has some um, kind of universal property in the sense that you can always subject on any uh, of this um, finite dimensional irreducible module uh, after specializing lambda to q to the n. And, and in general, uh, these are very, very um, important objects in, in representation theory. Uh, but I don't want to, to talk too much about this here. Uh, and they have a lot of interesting um, application in low dimensional topology. So, for example, you can use them to compute Humphrey BT polynomial, uh, Annular Jones polynomial, and what will interest us here, bread group representation. Uh, but we'll get back to this in, in the second part. OK. Uh, and in order to categorify this Verma module, I first need to tell you how to categorify the finite dimensional module. Uh, and so for this, I will uh, use the work of um, Chuan Huqie and, and Frankel Cohen of Stropper. And so we will categorify them using the geometry of the, the Grassmannian varieties. Uh, but don't worry if, if you are like me and you are not very comfortable with geometry because, uh, I mean, the geometry will be there as a motivation, but we, you don't need to understand the geometry to understand uh, what's going on because everything uh, will be explicit in the end. Okay, 
But so this Grossmannian, um, you can define them as, uh, so the Grossmannian GRKN, I define it as the space of a um, K plane in the uh, N dimensional space. And I will also be interested in uh, the, some iterated flag varieties of K plane in K plus one plane in, in, in C to the N. Um, and actually what we will need is not the, the Grassmannian themselves, but um, their cohomology. And so one can compute the cohomology of this uh, Grassmannian variety using churn theory. And this will give us a um, very handy formula because you can describe so the, the cohomology of my Grassmannian of K-plane in C to the N as a polynomial ring in, in N variable, modulo some um, ideal that is uh, determined by this formula. And so basically here these are my chunk classes and I model by the witness sum formula. And so for example, here this formula, it will tell me that uh, x1 plus y1 is zero and, and like things like x2 plus x1 y1 plus y2 is zero and so on. So you get a lot of a uh, uh, relation that will uh, generate your, your EDR. And so the point is this is very explicit so you can really do computation with this. Uh, and now the idea is that you can, the, the, the category we will use to categorify the, this finite dimensional uh, module will be category of graded module of uh, finite dimensional grid module, say, over the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian, because of course these are uh, naturally graded, so I can consider graded modules. Um, and essentially because, uh, because you are looking at like a, a graded quotient of a, a, a graded polynomial ring, you just have like one projective module, one simple module. So the Grothendieck D group is uh, one dimensional for each of this category. And because I take the, the, the direct sum over all of them, I have a, a n plus one dimensional um, Grothendieck D group. So this is nice. And, and the idea is that we will actually identify the, the free module HKN with the basis element VK of my, my finite dimensional representation. But of course, this is not enough because we want to define a categorical action. So uh, we need to define endofunctors. And this is where uh, I will use the, um, uh, this iterated flag variety. So when you look at a, at, at a point in my iterated flag here, I have a K plane in a K plus one plane in, in, in C to the N. And of course, you can always forget the K plane or forget the K plus one plane. And then you will get uh, either like a K plus one plane or uh, a K plane. And so it means that I have a map between my iterated flag uh, to my Grassmannians. I know these maps, uh, they induce map in the other direction in cohomology. And this will equip and uh, my, my, my cohomology of my iterated flag with a bimodule structure over the cohomology of the Grassmannian of K plane and the cohomology of Grassmannian of K plus one plane. And again, you can compute this uh, explicitly because it's also a, a quotient of some polynomial uh, ring. And you can make explicit this, uh, this action. I mean, you have uh, um, explicit formula in, in, in the literature. And already something interesting is that this uh, bimodule, it decomposes as a free module on the left and as a free module on the right uh, with um, and so, okay, and, and so it will decompose as a free module, but of, of um, and so you will get grading shift copy of your uh, ring of, uh, of of your cohomology of the the Grassmannian. And if you compute somehow the, the, the coefficient corresponding with this direct sum decomposition, it will coincide with quantum integer n minus k plus one and k plus one. And so this already means that if if I look at um, functor of tensoring with this bimodule. I will send, say, HKN to a direct sum in, in the category of HK plus one module of uh, basically K plus one copy of, 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 of the free module. And so it means that if I act by, uh, by tensoring with this by module, I will essentially send this guy to this guy and multiply by this factor. So this is exactly uh, the, the structure of constant I have here in my, uh, my finite dimensional module. So this already means that on, at the level of the growth and the group, uh, this functor will descend as the action of the, the quantum group on the finite dimensional representation. Uh, so yeah, so I do this, I can define my functor 
that will give me the, the categorical action. But this is not enough because what we want are natural isomorphism that categorify my defining relation uh, of my, my quantum groups. We just we don't just want things to hold at the level of the growth and the group. We also want uh, your, your relation to hold at the level, categorical level. Okay, but um, be before doing this, I, I just want to do a quick um, important sanity check to, to see uh, how things work. So uh, I will consider the here my 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 highest weight my highest weight uh, vector, okay. And so first I compute um, I look at the Grassmannian of zero plane in in C to the n, and of course you just have one zero space in C to the n, so you just have a point. So basically it's the cohomology of a point, and it is your ground ring. Uh, and then if I if I want to come to go for this from this uh, highest weight space. And if I act with first um, the bimodium corresponding to zero plane in, in one plane in C to the n, and, and then the other one, so I just need to compute uh, basically the cohomology of, of, of my Grassmannian of one plane in C to the n and zero plane in, in one plane in C to the n. And of course, these are the same because the, 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 the uh, zero space is, is not, uh, does not change anything. And it is um, basically the projective space CBN plus one. And the cohomology of the projective space is just qx on xn. And so what is mean here is that if I act uh, at the categorical level with e and f, I will basically tensorize uh, with this guy, this this uh, this projective space, but view as a vector space over q. So it means that I will just decompose it as a direction uh, depending on the dimension of this uh, this guy. And, and, and the graded dimension of this guy, of course, is one plus q squared plus, and so on, q two n minus two, because you just have one element in degree zero, and then you have x in degree two, and then x squared in degree four, and so on. And, and up to some global shift, this is essentially your quantum integer n. And so in, in conclusion, if I act with e and f, I will indeed basically take a direction of uh, in quantum integer n copy of my uh, ground ring. Okay, so this is the, the, the full picture. And now um, one can also show that you are, are actually have a categorification of the commutator relation. And in this case, it will be given in the form of some um, direction decomposition. So here, wh wh what I mean is that, um, so you have this functor ek and fk that uh, jump from uh, this category to the next one and then come back. And essentially, they are given by doing tensor product with some bimodule. And so you can think of things as okay, if I do, uh, I tensorize with this bimodule and this bimodule, so I, I got like a big bimodule. And this big bimodule is decomposed as a direction of uh, this bimodule plus uh, a bunch of copy of the, the identity bimodule shifted in, in different degree corresponding with uh, quantum integer n minus 2k. And so at the level of the functor, it means that I have like a natural isomorphism. Between these two guys. Mm. Okay. Um, and, and also, I, I, I must tell you some important um, properties of this, uh, this categorization is that the, the functor E and F are actually adjoint. Uh, so F is left adjoint to E, and, and this actually categorifies some um, symmetry on the quantum group. So basically, on, on the quantum group, you have uh, uh, an important anti automorphism. That essentially sent f to uh, e. I mean, you 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 need to multiply by some coefficient like q k or something, but essentially you send f to e. Sorry, um, can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Is it also true that e is left adjoint to f, or is it just in one way? I, I'm coming to there, and yes, you're right because and actually simply because they are adjoint and because you have this direction decomposition, from this you can deduce that that they are by adjoint. And so E is also left adjoint to F in, in this case. Okay. And, and somehow this categorified the, the fact that your um, uh, finite dimensional representation is uh, symmetric somehow. You can exchange the role of E and F and you still get like a finite dimensional representation. Um, okay, so this is, I mean, in, in, 
this is all well known for people in, in working in, in, in categorification. Uh, but now I want to to uh, to tell you uh, how to use this to categorify Verma module. Um, and so now the, the, the issue with Verma module is that you need to categorify structural constant such as this um, shifted quantum integer, so quantum beta plus k. And so you, he, now here you really have a fraction because somehow when we categorify the, the finite dimensional representation, we kind of cheated because all the structure constant appearing, you could simplify them into finite polynomial because you can always convert your uh, quantum integer into a finite uh, polynomials and then these finite polynomials is just like a direct sum of, of, of your identity shifted by some uh, degree. And so now here you cannot do such a trick. You cannot simplify this as a finite thing. And, and in general, it's not clear how to categorize fraction. It's not something, I mean, I, I don't think there exists any way to do this directly. But one well-known trick in categorification is not to categorify the fraction, but categorify its uh, expansion as a Laurent series. So when you work with um, your, your ring of fraction, you can always embed it in a ring of Laurent series. And, and so you can simply compute this uh, by doing some um, Euler division algorithm. Uh, and now this is something you can categorify because it's just an infinite direction. Okay, and so the first thing that we can do is we can obtain this fraction, so one on one minus Q square, or if you want the, the series one, one plus Q square plus Q four and so forth, uh, by working not in, 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 in the finite space anymore, but by working in the infinite space. So I can consider the space of, uh, of one plane in C infinity. And now the cohomology of this guy is just the polynomial ring QX in one variable X, where X uh, has a degree two. And of course, the greater dimension of, 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 of this guy is uh, one plus Q squared plus Q4 and so on, because you don't have uh, any correlation. And so, uh, and so this gives you a categorification of one on one minus Q squared. Uh, but then we, we are still missing the, the lambda and uh, the minus sign above. And, and the strategy to do this is will be okay. Uh, so we obtained this Q from some grading, uh, from some grading on the cohomology ring of, of Kruzmanian. So now this lambda, because it's uh, an independent parameters, we could obtain it simply by adding uh, an extra grading. So working with uh, bi-graded stuff. And the minus sign, well, it's like in, in the Euler characteristic case, you can obtain it by working with complex. So we should consider complexes of bi-graded space. And the strategy is now to find this, I mean, and our goal will be to find which complexes. And the strategy is to observe that there is an embedding of uh, this C to the N in C infinity. And this embedding, it will actually induce an action between the, the infinite projective space to the, to the finite projective space. And explicitly, it just means that you are projecting QX on QX uh, modulo by XN and simply sending X to X. And now, uh, my, my, my cohomology of the finite uh, projective space, it means a nice free resolution over the infinite one. Uh, because of course, the, the kernel of the projection is just all the uh, element that factorize through Xn. So you, you can simply construct such a, an exact sequence. And now this means that you actually have a quasi isomorphism between um, this mapping cone and this space. And here mapping cone, I mean, it's just a fancy word to say that I'm looking at the two terms complex where I have QX like in homological degree zero and QX shifted by two N in homological degree one. And, and the map is given by a multiplication by XN. And so of course, if you compute uh, the homology of this guy, you will recover this one. And, and the map is simply given by projection. But now the interesting thing is that you can think of this as a categorification of the equality between, uh, on one hand here on the right, of course you have this finite polynomial because it's a graded dimension of this guy. And on the other hand, you have the, the graded dimension of this guy, which now coincide with this uh, fraction. And so we, we found a way to uh, categorify the simplification from this rational fraction to this finite polynomial. And, and so what we, the next step will be to deform this left side such that we get the, the shifted quantum integer. Uh, and of, okay, and, and first, 
uh, you can do this in general. So in general, uh, the, the, the embedding of CN in C infinity induces an action from the, the Grassmannian of K-plane to the in, in infinity to the K-plane in, in uh, CN. And the K-plane in infinity is again just a polynomial ring in K variables. And uh, and you can construct a free resolution of your cohomology of finite Grassmannian uh, as module over the infinite one. And, and you can do this because basically you can obtain one from the other by uh, taking a quotient by a collection of uh, polynomials. And these polynomials from uh, uh, what we call a regular sequence in uh, uh, HK infinity. Um, so, uh, um, and essentially it means that you can, you can obtain, a, um, from this you can obtain a, what, you, what people call a causal resolution. And so what you do is you take your, um, so, your polynomial ring, you tensorize with an accelerator algebra uh, in, in K variable, and you equip this with a, a differential that will send each one of your accelerator variable to each of the elements you want to kill. Um, and, and so, of course, here you can directly see that in homology category zero, uh, the, the homology of this guy will be uh, your homology of the finite Grassmannian because the image of the differential will kill exactly this EDR. And then because they are a regular sequence, basically it tells you that everything in a higher homological degree uh, um, annihilates in homology. So this, this projection here is uh, indeed a quasi isomorphism. And, and the interesting thing here is that uh, this space omega k, so this, if you want the, the, the underlying algebra of my, my DG algebra, it does not depend on n. So somehow it is universal. And so now the idea is that we will use this universal DG algebra to get the categorification of the Verma. And so for this, we just need to in introduce our extra grading such that, for example, uh, the graded dimension of omega one. So omega one is just QX, mm, the cohomology of the, the infinite projective space, uh, tensorized with uh, next linear algebra in one variable. So basically it's QX plus omega one QX. Uh, and, and you want this to have the, the credit, dimen uh, credit dimension corresponding with my uh, quantum beta. So with one minus lambda square and one minus Q square. And so to do this, uh, I just need to put omega, R, uh, omega one right, in general, omega i in lambda degree two. Uh, and then because uh, uh, your, your element in omega one QX uh, part of omega of my big omega one here will be in omega, lambda degree two, uh, it will also mean that you must put the differential to zero. You cannot do anything else. And so you get a D. And so what I'm telling you is that I, I can choose this uh, DG algebra here, but change the differential to zero and put the omega i in, in uh, lambda degree two. Uh, and now you can do the same thing with the bimodule. So uh, you can also resolve somehow the, the cohomology of the um, iterated flight in CN as a module over the cohomology of a, um, iterated flight in, in C infinity. And then you, you can lift the, uh, the bimodule structure to the DG setting. And so this will turn uh, your omega k k plus one coming from this HK k plus one into a DG bimodule over the omega k and omega k plus one. Um, okay, and so uh, here is um, the, the, the full picture. So now I consider not um, a category of, of finite dimensional uh, gridded module, but I consider category of uh, DG, uh, derived category of DG module. You need to put some restriction uh, about the dimension of the, the DG module you consider, of course, because otherwise your category is too big and you have uh, uh, an empty Grotten D group, but uh, you, you can do it. Uh, and then you um, you categorify the, the, the action of the quantum groups by doing a tensor product with the, 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 the DG version of the, the HK, K plus one, so the omega K, K plus one. Uh, and because you're actually in a derived setting, you need to take um, derived tensor product, but uh, it, you, you, you can show that the omega K, K plus one are actually coffee brand as left and right module, so you can simply do usual uh, tensor product. Sorry, and then, what is the, sorry. Uh, what is the restriction on the derived category? Like what does the CBLF stand for? 
es essentially, you will ask that the, uh, the, the graded dimension of the homology is uh, a Laurent series in your uh, ring of Laurent series. OK, thank you. So somehow it's like containing a cone for some order uh, that we define and so on. Uh, OK, and, and 10k acts simply as a bi-grading shift. So here, the 1 means that I shift by lambda, and then so here I would shift like by lambda q minus 2 and, and so forth. OK. So Uh, and, and already from here, you can compute finite in the order, and you can check it coincide with the structure constant of the verma. So our, our, already here, we have like a weak categorification of the verma. Uh, but we, of course, we want also like some kind of natural isomorphism that will categorify the, the, the commutator relation. Um, but first, I need to warn you about something, is that, uh, again, you have an adjunction. So f is left adjoint to e. But now here is an issue. And the issue is that, well, a, a potential issue. And the issue is that if E and F are by adjoint, so if E is also left adjoint to F, then it's possible to show that um, basically if you, if you categorify a highest weight module, it will also be a lowest weight module. Because you can play with the, the property of the by adjunction to, uh, to slide somehow what kills the highest weight module to what kills the, the, the lowest weight module. So it means that we cannot hope to categorify Verma where uh, E and F are by adjoint. And the second issue is that um, if E and F are adjoint, and if you have like a direct sum decomposition that relate E and F as in the finite case, then E and F must be actually by adjoint. So what it means, because you already have this adjunction, is that we also cannot hope to categorify the, the commutator relation with a direct sum decomposition. So we need to find something else. And so uh, the, the, the solution that we, we found in Pedro uh, was that actually what you have is some, you have basically half a direction decomposition. So you have an, an exact sequence of by module. So if you want here on the left, I have uh, Fe, here I have Ef, and here I have like a, an infinite direction of the identity that uh, coincide with my, uh, shifted quantum integer. So this is already an instance of uh, my commutator relation, but as a short exact sequence. Uh, but, and, and the thing is, you can lift this, lift this to the DG setting. And the proper way to write it um, is as a quasi-isomorphism between the mapping cone. So again, mapping cone is just a way to construct a complex out of two that somehow correspond to their difference. So here is mapping cone. It, it, it corresponds with the difference of EF minus Fe along a certain map here that is, that is must be specified. And, and you can show that it is quasi isomorphic to some mapping cone of um, basically like here an infinite uh, direct sum and here an outer infinite direct sum that correspond to the two part of your, uh, that correspond if you want to k on one minus q square and k minus one on one minus q square. Um, and, and here you can also put back the, the differential dn. So not think of this as a categorification of the verma, but think of this as a categorification of the, the, of the finite dimensional module, uh, but in a DG setting. And then it's possible to show that this quasi isomorphism mapping cone, it actually corresponds with the direct sum decomposition in homology, if you want, that, uh, that we would have uh, in the classical categorification of the finite dimensional representation. Um, and now here, I think uh, that there is an interesting remark to, to make, uh, maybe I mean for, for, for the expert, is that somehow, so for me, I interpret this as the, the, the difference between this DG construction and the usual one, is that somehow in the usual one, what we are doing is not really categorifying the finite dimensional representation for quantum SL2, but we are categorifying the, um, the finite dimensional representation for loosely independent version of quantum SL2. Because you don't really have, uh, because your direction decomposition, it, it do not directly categorify this, uh, the, the commutator relation, but more like some truncated version of it. And in this DG setting, you are really categorifying directly the, 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 the relation 
uh, E S minus F E is K minus K minus one, Q minus Q minus one. Uh, okay, and so here in, in, in is a full picture for the categorical conversion of the verma uh, in, in resume. Okay, and so um, in, in, in conclusion, what uh, what I think is important to, to, to remember for the, the, the next uh, the next part is that quantum groups uh, representation are important for topology. In particular, the finite dimensional representation uh, Vn and, and the Verma module and, and lambda. Um, also, that you can think of the Verma module as some kind of universal limit of the finite dimensional representation when n goes to, to infinity. Um, that you can obtain categorification of the finite dimensional representation using a certain category of module over graded rings. And these graded rings are given. Um, explicitly by a quotient of a polynomial ring by certain ideals. And, and, and finally, that you can obtain the, the, the categorification of the Verma by computing a free resolution of this quotient over the, the polynomial rings. And um, I, I was a bit quick, but so we can take the break uh, five minutes early or ask some uh, questions. Um, okay. And, and again, as I already mentioned in, in the first part, uh, the category of representation of, of quantum SL2 come with, with a braiding. Uh, and this braiding, it comes from uh, the so-called R matrix. So the, the R matrix is actually like an element that live in, in some um, completion of the, the, the quantum groups uh, because it's, it's like an infinite sum. Uh, but, but for the sake of this talk, I will just think of the R matrix as um, an element in the space of intertwiners between a tensor product of two copy of my, my um, Verma module. Uh, and, and so this, um, this, this R matrix, you can actually um, define it explicitly using this, uh, this formula here. Uh, so you can see that here is indeed um, uh, an uh, infinite sum, but because you're acting on something that is um, a high sweat module, so because it's, uh, it, 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 at some point E act by zero, it will, it will always uh, truncate. But somehow, the further you go away from the highest weight, the, uh, the more complicated uh, computing the action of the R matrix uh, becomes. No, the precise formula is not important at all for the talk, of course. I just wanted to put it there for, uh, for you to have an idea of what it looks like. Um, OK. And, and so we will use this, this R matrix to construct a bright group action. And, and so, uh, for this, I will consider the bread group uh, as um, the group generated by the element sigma one up to uh, sigma r minus one, uh, modulo the, the following two, two relation. And, um, I, and so you can think of this sigma as what? As you look at, um, uh, at our strength, and sigma i will. Uh, uh, but a crossing between the i, and so of course the, the, the inverse of sigma i will be uh, the, the, the same thing, with, but in the other direction, so that when you compose them together, you can just unlock your, your strength. And, and then the relations are just uh, moving to distant uh, crossings. And, and this one is just you take a crossing and you slide it under a strand. OK. And, and so to define an action of the, the bread group on the tensor product of uh, our copy of, uh, of the lambda of the Verma module, what you do is you simply act with the R matrix on the IM and I plus one uh, copy of the, the Verma in, in your tensor product. And so of course, um, and, and, and so here it is this R matrix, also it is um, invertible. So you can uh, define sigma, the action of sigma i minus one as the, the inverse of r. And um, of course, you will get the relation sigma i, sigma j uh, is sigma j, sigma i uh, for free, because you would be acting on a distant tensor factor. And so essentially, the only, for, the only relation you need to check is uh, this one. And, um, and you obtain it be because the R matrix is constructed such that it respects the young maxwell equation. Um, all right, but it, the, the, the difficulty here 
is that, um, I mean, they're modular in finite dimensional. And so when you tensorize a lot of, uh, a bunch of copies of your Verma module, you can quickly get something that's quite complicated to understand. So because here this is an infinite dimensional uh, representation. But something that you can do is because R is an intertwiner, so because uh, R commute, commute with the action of the, the, the quantum groups, uh, so is uh, uh, the, the bread group. And so you can, um, and, and so R uh, preserve the white space. So, so the white space, if you want, is the, the eigenspace for uh, the action of uh, the Cartan element K. And you can make this explicit. So this, this white space, you can just think of the space generated by uh, the tensor product of uh, WY1 up to WYR, such that the sum of the Y1 up to YR is equal to B. Uh, and uh, where I, I we call you that the W i here are the basis element of the uh, the verma. So W zero is like a high weight vector, and then you have W one and, and so on. And so you just fix the number of uh, of the index. Uh, okay, and so you can restrict to the and and, and so it means that you can restrict the bread group action to these white spaces. Uh, and and these white spaces now they are finite dimensional. So what it means is that out of this um, bread group action on the tensor product of uh, several copy of the Verma, you get uh, a collection of finite dimensional representation of the bread group. Uh, so for, for example, on the, the, the highest white space, uh, you just have W0, W0, and so on. So you just have a one dimensional thing. So it's like a, a trivial representation. Uh, then on the second uh, white space, you can just have one of the uh, um, of the w uh, i that is one, uh, just one of the uh, ij sorry that is one, and so you get something that is uh, r dimensional uh, and so forth, and it, it becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, and also, of course, you get uh, two parameters representation because you have the q from the, the quantum groups, but uh, you also have the lambda from the universal verma. And now uh, Jackson and Carroll they observe that actually this the, the, the restriction of the action of the bread group on this way space, it going it is equivalent to some other well-known uh, representation of the bread group. Uh, the first observation is that if you look uh, at the second weight space, so M1R, um, you get essentially the bureau representation in, in its reduced version. Uh, now, for people who know about the bureau representation, uh, you might think that this sounds fishy because the bureau representation is a one parameter representation, and here I have two. And, and the reason why it is still more or less equivalent is because all the structure constants that appear uh, when I act with my, my R matrix on M1R will depend on lambda and will not depend on Q. And so if you do some, and basically you just need to do then a, a change of parameter, like the, say that the bureau representation depends on some parameter t, then you send t to something like minus lambda square or something like this, and you get uh, the same uh, virtual representation. Um, and they also observe that uh, if you go to the third weight space, then what you get is uh, the unreduced Lorentz Kramer bigger representation. Now this one is indeed a two parameter representation, and it is actually a very important one um, from a historic point of view, because it was the first uh, faithful representation of the bread group that was uh, constructed. And, and actually, this, in, in general, it is uh, this generalized because if you go to uh, further away white space, you get um, basically all uh, Lorentz representation in their unreduced version. Uh, but of course, if I, if I write unreduced, it's because the there also exists a reduced version. And, and, and for example, here for the bureau, the unreduced is, uh, uh, and the reduced version is uh, slightly smaller. So for example, here for the bureau, you have something that is R dimensional in the unreduced case and R minus one dimensional in the reduced case. And uh, interestingly, you can also obtain the reduced version out of this tensor product of Verma. And the idea is that instead of restricting to the white space, you should restrict to the highest white space. So you look at the subspace of elements that are killed by the action on E, 
inside a white space. And if you do this, you get something that is a, a bit uh, smaller. And so now my goal will be to categorize this picture. And so for this, uh, we have two things to do. The first one is that I must tell you how to categorize tensor product of Verma module, and also how to categorize the, the white space and the highest white space, and then how to categorize the action of the R matrix. Uh, luckily for us, we already know how, know how to categorize tensor product of finite dimensional representation. This has been developed by several people in, in, in a lot of different um, contexts, like in, in geometry category, or, uh, I, I don't know. Um, and the thing is, we will use Westerf approach, uh, which can because it can be translated in a complete um, algebraic setting, and, and then it will be easier to extend to the DG setting uh, as we did in the in the first part. And also, Westerf tell us. Uh, how to categorify our matrix, so we will be also be able to use this. And so the, the, the way Webster categorified the tensor product of uh, several copies of uh, finite dimensional representation, well, his motivation was by looking at um, Schubert's cell and Grassmannian, but again, I'm not uh, really comfortable with geometry, so I don't want to, to explain this, but the, the nice, Thing for me is that you can translate all this into a purely algebraic framework by working with diagrammatic algebra defined by generator and relations. And so for this, I can already give you an example of, of, of such a diagrammatic uh, algebra, and it is the, the nil hecke algebra. So the, the nil hecke algebra uh, is, 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 if you want, an, an algebra given by linear combination of elements, and this element, we draw them as uh, diagrams. So here I will consider diagrams on uh, k strand. So I have k black strand going from the, the bottom to the top. Um, and, and the algebra structure is simply given by stacking diagram on top of each other and connecting the, the starting point and end point. And usually uh, we will consider this diagram up to, to planar uh, bread-like isotopy, meaning that you can move stuff around uh, they more around a vertical axis. So if you have like distant crossing and stuff like that, you can move them. And also the strands can be decorated by dots and the dots you can also move them if they are distant from, uh, from the, the, the crossings. And finally, you impose some relation on this diagram, some local relation, oops. So whenever you have a big diagram and locally you have say a picture like this, then you can replace it by a picture like that. And finally, uh, if you consider this, the cyclotomic version of this nil hecke algebra, so it is the, the, the diagrammatic algebra with the extra relation that n dots on the left is zero, then you get an algebra that is actually a Morita equivalent to the cohomology of the, the Grassmannian variety of K in, in, in C to the N. And actually, the, 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 the two guys are closely related. You can also construct uh, this nil hecke algebra from the geometry of the Grassmannian if you want. Uh, and so it means that you can categorify the finite dimensional representation using category of uh, graded module over the cyclotomic nil hecke algebra, if you want. And now, um, what, so basically what Webster did was to construct a generalization of this cyclotomic nil hecke algebra, uh, where now, instead of working with um, just one uh, weight n, you have a string of non-negative integral weight. Okay. And so Western algebra is given again by looking at diagrams. But now what you have is um, our color strand that I draw in red. And these color strands are, are labeled by the, the weight that you, that you fixed up before. And also you put B black strand. And these black strands, they can cross other strand and carry dots. So you don't want the color strand to cross each other, but you can have black strand crossing uh, the color strand. And again, you look at this, uh, this guy up to uh, bread like panel isotopy, so you can move things around. And, and also, uh, I should mention that when you um, compose diagram, you want the label and the color to match. Otherwise, you simply say that the product is, is, is zero. OK, so here's an example with three red strands and, and two black strands. Um, OK, and, and then you want to impose some relation on this. Uh, algebra. So the first relation you impose are the nil hecker relations of the black strand because you want to generalize the nil hecker algebra. 
And then you add some relation that tells you basically how uh, the color strand interact with the black strand. So for example, if you intertwine a black strand and a red strand, you can uh, unknot it at the cost of adding a certain amount of dots, depending on the, the label of your red strand. And, and you have other similar relations that allow you to slide dots above a red uh, strand and, and, and things like that. And, and finally, you impose also some kind of cyclotomic condition that says that whenever you have a black strand on the left, it is zero. Um, and already from here, you can observe that the algebra we get, um, if we only have one red strand, so a one weight, then it will be equivalent to the cyclotomic nil Hecke algebra. And indeed, because, because of this con cyclotomic condition, you can basically assume that you do not have uh, diagrams with black strand on the left of the red strand. And whenever you have n dots on the, uh, the black strand immediately at the right of the, 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 the red strand, then it is zero because you, 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 would, you would apply this relation and then this is a black strand on the left of the leftmost red strand, so it is zero by this condition. So we have this nil Hecke cyclotomic condition. And of course you have the nil Hecke relation, so we, we, we indeed have a nice morphism. Uh, and, and then basically what, what Webster did was to show that uh, the, the growth in the group of the category of, because of, of course this, this guy also are uh, gridded, and, and the category of like finite dimensional graded module over this algebra uh, have a Grotten group that is um, isomorphic to the tensor product of the, the copies of the, the finite dimensional representation. Um, and actually, you, you have a lot of structure on this category. Uh, so, for example, it is standardly stratified, and then this will essentially tell you how how to decompose your uh, category five tensor product as sub representation and, and, and things like that. But I, I don't want to enter into this detail uh, here. Uh, but OK, so this is for the, the group and the group. But we also need a, a categorical action. And so um, the categorical action in this case is given by um, considering the map of algebra that at a vertical strand on the right. So whenever you have a, a diagram on, on B black strand, you can send it to a diagram on B plus one black strand by simply putting a vertical black strand on the right. So this is a map of algebra. And so you get induction and restriction functor along this map that, allow, that will allow you to jump from one um, category to the other. And this category uh, will categorify your uh, white spaces. Uh, but of course, now the question is how can we uh, get tensor product with Verma factors out of uh, this picture of, of, of Webster diagrammatic algebra? Uh, and so the strategy will be essentially to do the same thing as we did in the first uh, part. So first, we need to compute a resolution of the cyclotomic condition, somehow to, to DG enhance the quotient so that we are just working over stuff that are more or less free, or at least do not depend on, on, on the initial weight. Um, and then for the Verma factor, we will morally take the limit of Ni to infinity in, in, in some sense. Okay, so for the first step, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this cyclotomic condition, you can think of it as, okay, instead of killing um, black strand on the left, I will suppose I don't have black strand on the left, but whenever if N1 black strand on the, 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 the on, on, a, on N1 dots on a black strand immediately at the right of the leftmost red strand, then it is zero. And so this is the, the only relation we need to, uh, to DG enhance to get a resolution of the cyclotomic condition. Um, and so the way we do it is we simply replace this relation by a new generator that I, I would call a nail. That is like a four valent uh, vertex like this. And, and this nail, you put it in a homological degree one and you, put a, and you define a differential that we send this nail to your uh, basically cyclotomic uh, quotient. Of course, if you do this uh, naively like this, uh, you will get for free that uh, a DG algebra uh, with a homology in degree zero corresponding with uh, Webster's algebra, Webster's cyclotomic algebra. Uh, but of course, what you, what you, if you want to DG, uh, to, to, to really have a DG announcement is that you then you want 
to have nothing in higher homological degree, such that you get a quasi isomorphism between this DG enhancement and Webster algebra. Like we had before a, DG, uh, a quasi isomorphism between our uh, DG algebra and your or cohomology of the cross mine. Uh, and so the, 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 the way uh, we, we, we do it is by um, somehow looking at the relation that holds in, in the image of the differential and then try to integrate them in some sense. So for example, if, if you imagine that you have a dot here above and you apply your differential, then it will be sent to n1 plus one dot. But if you put your dot below, it will also be sent to n1 plus one dot. So it means that the kernel of the differential is not zero because uh, the, 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 this element will be sent to the same, uh, the same element. So if you take the difference, it's in the kernel. And so what we will do is add a new relation such that they become equal and then to, to if you want to annihilate the, the kernel. Uh, so I don't have a secret formula to do this. We don't have an algorithm. We are actually working uh, with, with, with Benjamin Dupont, uh, trying to uh, find maybe rewriting tools or things like that, to, that would allow us to uh, to do this more in more generality. But in, in, in this special case, the only way we we could do it is simply by doing it by hand and then verifying that the, the homology indeed corresponds. Um, all right, so this, is, this was for the first step. So if you believe me, we can construct a DG algebra like this, that DG enhances the Webster algebra. And now for the, the other step, we need to, uh, to, to, to take the limit of NI for the Verma factor. So for this, we can observe that in Webster algebra, well, there are only these two relations that depends on uh, the label N. So these are the two relations we need to replace to get uh, the, the Verma. And if you take N to infinity, somehow it means that here you need to put infinity many dots and, and this does not make sense. So what we do is we simply say, okay, this is sent to zero. And so we put this kind of degenerate relation. And, and the same thing here, you would need like an infinite sum of infinite, infinitely many dots. And so you just remove this term. And so for each Verma factor, we will put not a red run, but a blue run like this with these relations. And these are the, the, the only two ingredients you need. So in, in resume or, or, or DG Webster algebra, um, they are defined for a string of uh, SL2 weights where each of these weights can either be uh, non-negative integral. So uh, it will be a um, finite dimensional uh, factor or they can be a generic beta and then it means that I'm putting a, a Verma factor. And so I consider diagrammatic algebra where I still have R color strands, but now I will draw the, the strand in red when the label is integral and in blue when it is uh, generic. I still have B black strands and can carry dots and, uh, and cross other strands. Uh, I add the condition that uh, the first strand must be colored, so I cannot have black strand on the left. And finally, I can uh, nail the black strand on the leftmost colored strand. So these, these are my new generator in homological degree one. So here is like an example of such a, a diagram. And on this, we impose all the, the relation uh, that we want. So broad like final isotopy, the nil hecker relation on the black strand, and, and, and our kind of random master two and three relation between the black and red strand. So here, the usual one of, of what's there when uh, you have an integral weight and uh, the new one for the Verma. And finally, as promised here, the, you, ha you have a collection of uh, relation involving the nails that will allow you to say that, well, okay, when all my red strand, uh, all my color strand are red, then I have something that is quasi isomorphic to, to Webster. Um, and, and for example, here, this is a relation that I told you about, uh, because when you apply the differential, it can be sent to n plus one dot and n plus one dot. Okay, uh, and so of course you want this to be again a, a bigraded DG algebra. So you better by grading, uh, and you define a differential. Now here is a subtlety because of course uh, I told you about DG enhancement of Webster algebra. So in this case, when we had the first strand that was uh, for an integral weight, 
So we would send the nail to uh, n, n1 dots. But if the first strand is a verma, so a generic weight, then you simply, again, put the differential as 0. So uh, also from, and so from here, you can see that if you just have one weight, so just one colored strand, it can either be red, and then again, we get like the DG enhancement of the, the, uh, the DG enhancement of the Neil Hacker, cyclotomic Neil Hacker algebra, or we put, we put it blue, and then the differential is zero. And of course, we have the, the, something that is equivalent to our um, categorification of the verma in, in the first part. And if all the strand, and if now you have multiple weights, but all the weights are um, integral, then you get something that is quasi isomorphic towards our algebra. So it encodes uh, everything. Um, and again, you can define a categorical action on the derived category of a bi-graded DG module over this guy by doing a derived induction and derived restriction along the map that at a vertical extent on the right. And, and, and similarly, as in the first part, because uh, the, the algebra are somehow very nice, um, actually, you can rewrite this derived uh, induction and derived restriction as simply doing a usual tensor product of DG by module. So you can make this uh, quite explicit and, 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 and computable. Uh, and now again, as, as in the first part, uh, you can categorify the SL2 commutator relation as an isomorphism or a quasi-isomorphism of a mapping cone. Um, and finally, you can compute the, the, the growth ending group of uh, these um, derived category, and you can show that it coincides with the, the tensor product of both my uh, finite dimensional representation and Verma module, depending on the way that I uh, have chosen. Uh, and, and here is, is maybe more a, a remark for the, the experts. Is that as, as I mentioned before in, in Webster case, um, the, the category of, of, of graded module, they are standardly stratified. So you, you have all this um, interesting structure that tell you uh, about the different bases that you are categorifying and, and, and so forth, and also how to like, include um, the categorification of the, the factor into the tensor product and, and using the standardization functor. Uh, now, in, in this case, uh, you don't have like really a, a, a standard certification anymore, but you, you have it in a derived sense. So it is what I would call triangulated, standardly stratified. Uh, and, and so basically what you can do is you look at your uh, projective DG module uh, and you can construct some uh, standard module out of them by, co by considering some uh, iterated mapping cone construction. Uh, and, and, and basically, you look at the definition of a standardly certified category, and you replace all the condition by derived equivalence. So for example, instead of having that the projective are uh, filtered by the standard module, uh, in, in our case, here we have that the projective are finite iterated extension of the standard, and, and, and things like that. So you just replace all the, diff, all the, the, the elements in your definition by derived equivalent, and, and you will get the structure that we have here. And, and again, and also we, we can construct an explicit standardization functor that categorify the, the inclusion of the tensor factor. So I think this is, these are also things that are interesting to, uh, to study and maybe develop in, in the future. Okay. Um, so this is all I, I wanted to tell you about for the, the categorification of the, of the tensor uh, product of, of, of Verma modules. So if you have any question about that, no, it's, uh, it's the moment. Otherwise, we can uh, go to the... Gregoire, I do have a question about that. Uh, so, so this triangulated standard certification, uh, does it have anything to do with existence of some kind of Rekolma diagram? Of, of what? Uh, a Rekolma diagram, sorry, my French is very bad. Uh, so in, in the original paper by Klein, Parshall and Scott, when they defined uh, uh, highest weight categories, so they started from the Rekolma diagram for triangular oh. categories. Rekolma, right? okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I don't know. Uh, I will look into it because I don't know. Actually, I don't know much about um, 
uh, highest weight category, to be honest. So this is something I need to study more and then uh, see what, uh, our, uh, what do we have in this triangulated uh, version. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So now to, to get the, the uh, bread group representation, we will need to restrict to, uh, to the special case where I only put generic weight because I want to categorify uh, the tensor product of several copies of the verma. And so in terms of our um, diacrobatic algebra, it means that I look only at uh, blue strands. Okay. Um, uh, luckily, um, Webster also has categorified uh, the, the action of the air matrix on his construction. And so the strategy is that we can also simply DG enhance it. So the way you would do it is by defining some uh, by model, by generators and relation. And then you would show that doing derived tensor product with this by module actually categorify the action of the air matrix. Uh, and it appears that we can define or the by module exactly the same as uh, he would do it. So you consider at diagrams where you will still have like R blue strand and, and, and B black strand, but now you would, you would put a crossing between uh, the I and I plus one blue strand, which of course is not allowed in the um, in, in Webster algebra. Um, and so you, you, you equip this with a bimodular structure simply by uh, stacking the diagram above or below. So for like the left action and the, the right action. And you consider this with the same uh, relation as uh, in, in, in Webster algebra. And you add some uh, new local relation involving this, uh, this crossing. Um, now this works well when i is bigger than one. Um, and indeed, because if i is one, you, you will run into troubles because then here, here, and here, and here also, you would have a black strand on the left of the leftmost uh, blue strand. And like I, I mentioned before, this is not allowed in our DG announcement. So this, this relation, you could just ignore them and say, okay, they do not exist when i is one. But this relation, it, it will give you problem because in, in Webster algebra, this is, this is telling you that this guy here is zero because of this cyclotomic condition. Uh, but it, it, now the thing is because we obtain our DG algebra by DG enhancing the cyclotomic condition, it means that we also need to construct our braiding by module by DG enhancing this relation when I is one. And so the, uh, the strategy is to add a new generator. Again, that would be the DG enhancement of the cyclotomic relation. This guy is zero when I is one. And so I draw it as I have a, a blue crossing and a, and a black nail on top of it. And you equip this with a non-trivial differential, because otherwise the, the differential in, in the algebra is trivial because I only have generic weight. So here I, I, I put a non-trivial differential that will kill me uh, in homology, this element. Uh, now the difficulty is that if you do this, you will create new relation in higher homological degree. And if you try to, to destroy this relation simply by adding a new relation in your bimodal, everything will collapse. So what you need to do is actually DG enhance the relation that you have created in a higher homological degree by uh, adding a new generator in homological degree two. And then you need to add one in, in homological degree three and so forth. And so at the end of the day, to, to categorify your braiding on, on, on the first two, two strands, you need to construct this D, big DG by module where you have infinitely many new generator in different homological degree with this non-trivial uh, differential. So it becomes quickly very hard to compute anything. Of course, uh, if you are just interested by restricting to the first weight spaces, 
So the white space is corresponding to the number of black strands. So if you just look at the second white space or the third white space, you just have like one black strand or two black strands, then I think it's still okay because you just have one or two new generator. And so you can still do computation and understand how things work. Now, uh, in general, we define the braiding functor as doing a derived tensor product with this uh, DG by module. Uh, and so currently, this is still a work in progress, but um, we are uh, working on showing that in general, this gives you an, equi an auto equivalence and that it respects the, the bread group relation up to uh, quasi isomorphism. And also, we would like to show that it uh, respects some higher covariance relation that would allow us to tell that we really have a strong categorical bread group action. But like I said, be because the formula gets quickly very complicated. Uh, it's actually hard to, to show this uh, in, uh, in general. But for the moment, what sorry, what we can do, of course, is restrict, like I said, to one black strand or two black strand. And then we can just do things by hand and show that indeed we have the, the isomorphism, the quasi-isomorphism we want. Also, um, now I think it's a good time to mention another difficulty uh, that, uh, well, maybe I should have done before, but um, Okay, so also because uh, of this relation that when you have a blue strand and a black strand that intertwines each other, you, you get zero. Um, it's not easy to construct basis for all the, the algebra and by module we are working with. Because the, us the usual strategy is that you construct a, a generating set and you show that it is linearly independent by uh, constructing like a faithful polynomial action, like a, a faithful action on a polynomial space. But this relation here tells you that if, if, if you want to do it in, in uh, with the usual strategy, uh, one of these crossing here would act as zero. And then there is no hope that this is uh, indeed, that we get, you get like a faithful representation that allow you to show that your basis elements are indeed linearly independent. And so the, the way, the, the, the tools that we, we had to use is rewriting methods. And so basically, you, you, you can use rewriting methods to construct basis for uh, your algebra. Uh, but for the, the by module, it's uh, much harder. And so again, uh, you can do it when B is one or two. But in, in general, it's not so easy to show that uh, your rewriting system uh, has the, the, the proper properties needed to uh, compute your basis. So this is why this is actually a hard problem. Um, okay, but for, for, for B equal one and two, we can do it, so that's good. And also, uh, we can show that there are natural isomorphisms between our braiding functor, composition of the braiding functor, and action of the uh, quantum groups, categorical action. And, and so it means that we, we, we really have like a categorical intertwiner for the categorical action. Uh, but of course, so this. this tell you that we can construct a um, categorical broad group action on uh, this categorified tensor product of verba, but it does not tell you that you are really categorifying the action of the air matrix. Uh, and so the way that we can do to, to verify this is by looking at how explicitly this braiding functor acts on your basis element. So what you do is you fix like a projective module here, you act with your bimodule. So this projective module, it will just fix an item button at the bottom of your diagram. And then you compute a projective resolution of this bimodule uh, with the end embedded on the right as, as left module. And it will tell you how to rewrite it as a basically a linear combination of the, uh, the projective module and so on the, of the basis element. And we can check that this formula coincides with the, the action of the air matrix on the tensor product of Verma. And so here are some examples. Can I just ask, are these isomorphisms of DG functors or are they in the homotopy category? Um, let me think. Uh, I, I mean, are they quasi I, I don't know if they are hold in the homotopy category because a lot of time I just construct one side of the quasi isomorphism and I compute homology. Okay, so but these are genuine quasi isomorphisms. They're not isomorphisms. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. You can construct a map and then show you, you have a, at least in the example that I did. Okay. And actually, I think that um, 
I mean, th this is more difficult, of course, if, if one of the term is, uh, I mean, here it is, these are actually genuine um, isomorphism of DG by module. Okay, okay. Uh, because, I mean, so, somehow you, you have something similar as in a Webster, and it is that when you compose this braiding functor, you can replace the derived tensor product with a usual one. Okay. And, and then you here you have genuine uh, isomorphism of, uh, yeah, by module. And here, I think when I is not one, then you also have a genuine isomorphism of DG by module. And it is like just a quasi isomorphism when I is one. Okay, okay, thank you. That's... And here, I think it's, if I, yeah, I'm, I, yeah, here also, it's a genuine isomorphism of DG by module. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, okay, and so for example, here are some uh, computation for of coffee brand replacement. So here you fix an idempotent on the bottom. It will tell you you have like a backslant here, and 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 you can resolve it as like a complex like, like this. I mean, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And and when of course when uh, i is one, it is a bit different because somehow the action of the matrix is, is truncated. Some terms become zero, and so instead of having a three-term complex that resolves your by module, you have a two-term complex. Uh, and now the thing is, uh, when the number of black strand increase, so this is just for, for one black strand, but when it increase, things get more complicated very quickly. So here's an example for two strand, and then it just like, explode. Uh, <laughs> so that's why uh, for the moment, we can only do it uh, in details for one and two black strands. And here again, if y is one, uh, it truncates. And you can show that all the, the, the coefficient correspond on the level of the Grothendieck group. So in conclusion, we can categorify. Okay. Uh, okay. So this was for, and, and so this tells us that we have categorification of unreduced bureau and unreduced Lorentz Kramer Bigelow. Uh, and if we want to categorify uh, the reduced version, we need to restrict to the highest white space. Now the, the naive thing to do would be to say, okay, I will just look at the subcategory of modules that become acyclic when I act with uh, my categorical E. The problem is I don't know how to study such a category. I have no idea what kind of tools could be used to do that. So the strategy that we are using for the moment is that, okay, instead of doing that, I look at the non-category file level uh, at basis element that generate my highest weight module. So when you have like a formula, like some linear combination of, of, of basis element, and I categorified this formula as some iterated mapping code. And so this gives me DG modules. And then I can look at the subcategory generated by these DG modules. And I will take this as a categorification of my highest uh, white subspace. Uh, and then basically, and, and, and what you can check is that they are indeed killed by the action, the categorical action of E. So you get something acyclic when you act with this. And now the difficulty here is to check that when you act with your um, categorical braiding, you stay in this category. So you can uh, still decompose uh, the, 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 the image in terms of uh, iterated extension of these DG modules. And again, we can do it in, 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 in small example, but showing this in, in, uh, in general is not something uh, that seems easy. And so for example, here is, is an example of a such a DG module that categorify a basis element in my uh, second white space. Okay. Um, and now I would like to end on, on some loose ends. Uh, the first one is that, of course, the bureau representation was already uh, categorified by Kovan um, of Seidel. And, and you can relate this to like zigzag algebra and, and, and circle category. And for the moment, uh, I have no idea uh, how this is related to our categorification. Uh, I, I would like to see maybe a two functor from circle category to uh, our categorification of the tensor product of Verma. But the difficulty here is that because we are in this um, the right setting, it's actually very hard to compute the home space between our DG functors. Because basically you need to understand um, coffee brand replacement of the DG by modules, module at left and right. Uh, module and this is not something easy to do. So uh, especially with this quite complicated diagrammatic algebra. Um, or, and, and so, okay, yes, uh, like I said, this categorification of Lorentz Kramer Bigelow, I, I think it's interesting because 
uh, I believe is the first uh, categorification of this representation in, in, in the literature, but it is still a bit unwidely in practice. It's really hard to compute this derived category and this, this DG action. Um, and so, for example, in, in, so if you look like at, at, at what's your approach, you can uh, take some how the causal dual side and you get a um, Kovanov approach. So you can replace all these derived tensor product with uh, by using like um, and, and, and things like that that are much nicer and, and work in a homotopy setting. Uh, and, and so I think it would be really nice to try to see if there is also like some kind of, I don't know, causal dual side of, uh, of, of what we are doing using maybe some foam or something like that that would be much uh, easier to, uh, to handle. And, and, and finally, this, all these lower representation, they have a geometric interpretation as, um, as the action of the bread group on the homology of certain covering space of the configuration space of B point on the arc picture disk. And so I wonder if maybe, uh, so, so, so if, if, you know, if maybe it is somehow lift to the categorical setting in, in, in some sense, it is also something that I think should be uh, investigated in the future. And this is all I, I, I have to say for, for the moment, uh, because we are still working, like I said, on, on the detail for the, the general case. And so hopefully you will be able to find this on the archive in, in a couple of months. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions from the audience? So if you have any questions, please speak up. Uh, if there are no questions, I have a question to your first question on this uh, slide. Uh, so, Havanov Zeidel categorification is uh, in some version, is not very complicated to compute. But, um, so, so here, here, here you say that, that, that you want a two functor, maybe from Zergil category to your, DG version of the quantum group, or so, so what, what kind of two functor do you want to have from, in order to be able to answer your first question here? Well, I mean, I mean basically, you can construct some, uh, I mean, you, you can look at least at um, derived category of bimodule over our diagrammatic algebra. And I mean, we need to be a bit careful with the, the two structure, but we could at least hope to have some uh, functor from like the home space in sort of category to this derived category of, uh, of, uh, of my modules. So, so you're trying to see your categorification as a2 representation of Zagel bimodules. Yes. Okay. I would I would hope for something like this, but yeah. I don't know if it's true. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's it's it's quite it's quite a good general question because because you have this this kind of categorification of the break group by Zagel bimod. I mean, on on the on the Zagel bimodules, and how general that is. Because I mean, you you get you get all these um, all these bread group actions with these AM configurations and mirror symmetry and so on, and uh, I mean, I would be quite curious to know in what generality these things then actually give rise to some circle by module two representations. But I think that's probably not an easy question. So so I don't I don't know how you I mean, yeah, I don't know how universal the Circle bimodule categorification of the break group is in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I somehow, uh, I even, uh, I think uh, uh, Zergel bimodule category is also 
maybe a little bit too small? Should one consider some kind of complexes of the organ yes, by modules? I mean, so, so they they consider they consider the the homotopy category. Ah, okay, okay, that that makes more. Oh, sense. I mean, I mean, in my in my in my uh, worldview, you should consider the the DG category of complexes and only pass to homotopy at the latest uh, possible point. So on on the DG level, you don't get you don't get um, break group relations, but but the moment you pass to the homotopy category, you just lose way too much structure. But but yes, I mean you you have to 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 get break group relations, you need to pass to the um, to the homotopy category. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions?